Federal Tort Claims Act is the primary vehicle for suing the federal government for money damages for injuries. As we noted in the introduction to the Federal Tort Claims Act discussion, it requires claims be filed with the government before they go to court. This traps many lawyers who are not familiar with the special procedures of the Federal Tort Claims Act. In this discussion, we're going to look at the fundamental difference between Federal Tort Claims Act cases and private tort claims. This mostly arises from the discretionary function immunity, a particular defense in the Federal Tort Claims Act that was intended to pr protect government policy and dis discretionary decision making from being challenged through tort litigation. first big case that made it to the Supreme Court construing the Federal Tort Claims Act arose out of the Texas City disaster in 1947. This was an explosion of two ships carrying ammonium nitrate fertilizer in the harbor. It wreaked enormous destruction in the area. This is a picture of a fire truck that was destroyed by the blast. Uh, this is an aerial picture of the blast of the fires after the blast in Texas City. Texas City is a port city uh, on the coast of Texas on the inland side of the bay from Galveston, Texas. The fertilizer was being shipped out of the port to go to Europe as part of the Marshall Plan that was the U.S. government aid to rebuild Europe after World War II. There were more than 500 dead. There was never a clear count because there were so many bodies that were never recovered. Thousands were injured and there was massive property destruction. A large number of cars were destroyed that were parked around the port. Many residential houses were destroyed. Most of the downtown was destroyed. This particular litigation <coughs> included about 8,500 claimants. The general claim in the lawsuit was that the United States was negligent in the way that it shipped or permitted shipment in a congested area of this fertilizer grade ammonium nitrate. There was also allegations that it had not been pa properly packaged. Um, the, the allegations were fairly general because under classic private tort law, Folks that are handling an ultra-hazardous substance, such as fertilizer-grade ammonium nitrate, uh, are held to a higher standard of duty than uh, the general tort claim. This is sort of considered a hazardous product or perhaps even an ultra-hazardous product given the explosive nature of the ammonium nitrate fertilizer. We're familiar with this from its use in both blasting for highway construction and it's used in, it's use in terrorist bombs such as the bomb that was used to destroy the federal center in Oklahoma. The trial court made specific findings that the government had been careless in drafting and adopting the fertilizer export plan, that there was specific negligence in various phases of the manufacturing process, those which emphasized official dereliction of duty and failing to police the shipboard loading. When we look at these, though, they look more like race ipsa loquitur claims, i.e. that the fact that this exploded spoke for itself, that it should not have exploded in the absence of negligence. Again, that would be a, a reasonable base for a private tort action when you're involved with the handling of a hazardous or ultra hazardous substance. We will find though that this is not going to be sufficient for the Federal Tort Claims Act claims. The trial court ruling was long, 20,000 plus pages of record, which would be consistent with handling a multi-party litigation involving 8,500 plaintiffs. There were exemplar trials using representative plaintiffs to determine negligence. 
Uh, these cases are tried to the judge, not to a jury. The trial court found that the United States was liable under the Federal Tort Claims Act for the damages caused by its negligence in allowing the shipment and the way the shipment was handled out of the Texas City port. The government appealed the trial court's verdict for the plaintiffs to the Fifth Circuit. The government argued that the negligent findings by the trial court were actually findings questioning the discretionary decisions the government had made in how to handle the shipment and the manufacturing of the shipment. Since those were sheltered by the discretionary function exception in the act, the government argued that the claim should be dismissed. The Fifth Circuit agreed and dismissed all of the claims. This decision was then appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. key question before the Supreme Court is the meaning of the discretionary function exception. This is the first time the Supreme Court is construing the Federal Tort Claims Act and the discretionary function exception, and the court has to decide whether it's a very narrow defense for specific statutory or regulatory duties or whether it's a broad protection for all discretionary acts. The court spend some time looking into the history of the act and the congressional findings surrounding the act to determine what Congress really intend with it, intended with it. There was an argument by the claimants that this was really meant to be a very narrow exception only to shelter actions that were required by statute or a regulation government countered that it was a very broad protection in, in, that was intended to shelter all government decision making. Let's look at the actual language of the statute broken into paragraphs for easier reading. The first is that it's any claim based upon an act or omission of an employee exercising due care in the execution of a statute or regulation. Any claim would appear to be fairly broad, but the phrase exercising due care might imply that there are limitations on this, that if you're negligent, how can you be exercising due care? Uh, we'll find that later provisions really sort of read exercising due care out of the statute. The next is whether or not such a statute or regulation be valid. So as with qualified immunity in 1983 cases and other circumstances for qualified immunity, the agency can rely on a statute or regulation even if it's later found that the statute or regulation is invalid. Based upon the exercise or performance or failure to exercise or perform a discretionary function or duty on the part of a federal agency or employee of the government. This gives us our broad notion of anything that involves a discretionary function. So the court will need to figure out what discretionary function means. And finally, whether or not the discretion involved be abused. This is a clear indication that this is intended to be a very broad provision. Even if the government employees are abusing their discretion, their actions are still sheltered from liability under the Federal Tort Claims Act. The court found that Congress was clear that discretionary actions didn't include ordinary torts such as negligent operation of an automobile. So for things like automobile collisions and other day-to-day -day tort activities, there would be liability under the Federal Tort Claims Act. That these couldn't be sheltered under discretionary authority. Now, that doesn't mean that decisions that might lead to automobile accidents, such as choosing to not do routine maintenance as frequently on, on a fleet of government vehicles might not be sheltered but the ordinary driving and negligent operation of automobiles would not be sheltered under the act.
The court also found that since the administration of a statute or reg appears disjunctively in the second phrase of the section that the discretionary function exception is not limited to statutory duties. So it's not just things that the, the agency is required to do by statute. In the court's formulation, the discretion is not the discretion of the judge, which is a power to decide within the limits of positive rules of law subject to judicial review. That would be a very narrow definition of discretion. The court found it was the discretion of the executive or the administrator to act according to one's judgment of the best course, a concept of substantial historical ancestry in American law. So the court is equating the notion of discretion with the notion of the authority of an administrator in the executive branch. This will lead to a very broad definition of a discretionary function. The court found that the Tort Claims Act and discretionary function immunity section 2680 read in their entirety make it clear that Congress wanted to give the government the maximum protection for its discretionary decision making. As the court said, the bill is not intended to authorize a suit for damages to test the validity or provide a remedy on account of such discretionary acts, even though negligently performed and involving an abuse of discretion. So rather than giving claimants a chance to test agency policy in court, those lawsuits are cut off by the discretionary function exemption. This is intended to allow the government decision makers to make their decisions without having to worry about being second guessed in lit later litigation. In this specific case, the court found that the decisions on handling and the storage and shipping of the fertilizer grade ammonium nitrate and how the fire was later handled by the Coast Guard were classic discretionary choices by the government. Now, it's clear that had these same decisions been made by a private party, say a shipping company contracted to move fertilizer by uh, private uh, companies, there might have been liability for these same decisions. This was clearly a hazardous activity, if not an ultra-hazardous activity. Uh, and had this been a private tort claim, it very likely would have succeeded. This is another pattern we're going to see in these mass tort claims under the Federal Tort Claims Act. There might have been liability un for private parties, but not for the government. Allen versus United States gets us to the next question about discretionary function immunity. This is implicit in the Dalhite ruling that if the government makes dis discretionary choices, makes intentional choices, it can't be held liable for them. But that leaves open the question of if the government makes intentional choices that will either intentionally or knowingly injure the public, is the government liable for those choices? So Allen poses this question fairly directly. The Allen case, we're dealing with intentional actions by the government that it knew would injure people. This was well understood. It was, in fact, uh, part of what the testing that's in Allen was about was finding out the particular dangers of what they were doing. The Allen case arose from above ground nuclear testing. Uh, these tests started in the 50s and extended into the early 1960s. The, this particular case came from the Atomic Energy Commission's choice of a site in Nevada as a testing site. Uh, between 1950 and 1962, there were eight series of open air tests were conducted. The president approved each series of tests. Over 100 atomic bombs were detonated. In 
each of the tests were executed according to detailed plans which the Atomic Energy Commission officially reviewed and adopted. There were separate plans for protecting the public and for providing the public with appropriate information. These were also adopted by the AEC. So we find the Atomic Energy Commission, which both approves the tests and reviews safety for the tests, uh, is the agency responsible for determining what the public should uh, know and how much danger the public can be exposed to. Um, this is seen, it was seen as a conflict of interest and the Atomic Energy Commission was later split into two pieces. The Atomic Energy Commission, which advocates for the use of nuclear power and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which actually regulates things like the construction of nuclear power plants. It was well known at the time of the testing was done that there was significant hazard associated with above ground nuclear testing. At the actual ground zero, the blast site, there's a massive flash. If you're close enough, it will uh, incinerate you, set all flammable materials on fire. There is a shock wave that will knock over everything that is close by and there is a burst of radiation that will either kill or directly or very shortly kill anyone nearby from radiation sickness. It's extraordinarily dangerous to be near the blast site, but the test site was sufficiently large that they were able to control access to the test site and there's no allegations that anyone was injured by the direct effects of the blast. Whenever you do above ground nuclear testing, you also create particles, nuclear par radioactive particles, we term them fallout, that are blown into the atmosphere. Some are blown high into the upper atmosphere and circulate in the upper atmosphere for years before finally falling out. Um, folks who were young, pe young people with teeth forming during this period of testing, uh, you can detect the certain radioactive isotopes uh, or uh, isotopes from the reactions, even though they're not radioactive, by slicing and analyzing the teeth that were formed during that period. Some of the isotopes have a very short half-life, some are very long-lived, so you get a mixture of short-term and persistent radiation and fallout. If the fallout is ingested, can be breathed in, can be eaten along with food, can be picked up on your hands and rubbed into your eyes or nose, then they can cause cancer and children are especially susceptible to this. Some of the isotopes specific, uh, from above ground testing accumulate uh, in the thyroid and lead to thyroid cancer as a particular marking of cancer related to above ground nuclear testing. In this particular case, there was actual epidemiologic evidence of increased cancer risk downwind. Plaintiffs make the claims that you would expect that the government exposed them to unreasonable risk, that the uh, AEC representatives, the RAD safety officers, and the test information officers didn't provide the public with proper information. They didn't fully monitor the off-site fallout, and they didn't do long-term health screening of people that might have been exposed to the fallout. Now, this raises a, a, a difficult discretionary function question immediately. What if the government had informed the community that they and their children and their pets were going to be exposed to dangerous persistent contamination with radioactive material? This would have caused an upcry, an outcry probably would have been subject to massive media coverage even back in the early 1950s and would have made it very difficult for them to go ahead with the testing. trial court did find that people were injured and 
that there might have been fewer injuries if the testing had been conducted differently. Had this been private uh, litigation, there certainly would have been liability. The court found many negligent choices. This is just a sampling of them. Uh, the decision to only do random monitoring rather than comprehensive person-to-person -person monitoring. Uh, decisions to not use thyroid or whole body counters, since we know that the radiation accumulates specifically in the thyroid. Uh, decisions regarding sampling and health sampling in general. The decision not to test milk samples. And the particular reason that they didn't want to test milk was in order to avoid arousing public concern. Now this shows that the government was aware of the risk, was aware of the hazard, and was certainly aware that if the public had known about it, they would have been upset and would have been opposed to the testing. And finally, the decision to forego any internal fallout assessment from in a inhalation of fallout particles. So they really didn't do any attempts to measure the uh, type of particles and the frequency of them that would be subject for inhalation. The district court had a long record of the trial, uh, again, with some exemplary cases tried. Uh, the trial court found that the government was liable under the Federal Tort Claims Act. The trial court construed the, tr the Federal Tort Claims Act somewhat differently than the Dalhite court. It actually did a cost-benefit analysis and found that while the government might be allowed to do this testing, then because the benefits the government would get from the testing that they should be responsible to pay for the damages caused by the testing. Government's primary defense is that nuclear, that they knew that the testing was dangerous. Uh, the above ground nuclear testing was controversial when the test started. It was well known to be dangerous before the testing ended. The government knew of the risks and chose to go ahead with the testing. So the government is not contesting the danger. It's not actually contesting that people were injured. It's just going to contest whether that is basis for liability under the Federal Tort Claims Act. Now, while the Federal Tort Claims Act doesn't require a justification or cost-benefit analysis for the discretionary function exception, the government did provide justification. These were tests done pursuant to national security needs. We were in a nuclear arms race with the Soviet Union and China. We needed to do above ground nuclear testing in order to assess the changing designs of the nuclear weapons. Uh, at that point, we were trying to make them more reliable, more compact. Um, and we wanted to know exactly how the changes in design would affect the bombs. It was not until years later that we developed computers with sufficient power to model these nuclear weapons and thus ultimately obviate all above ground testing and most below ground testing. The cost benefit was simple. It was a lot easier to, to do the tests and monitor them in the United States. We had originally done testing in the South Pacific. Um, the U.S. was very highly criticized globally for those tests because they exposed the indigenous populations to radiation and made several atolls uh, essentially desolate wastelands for thousands of years in the future because of the radioactive waste contamination. As with the Dalhite case, the long trial record and findings of fact were overruled by the appeals court in a fairly brief opinion. The court found that there was no evidence of act or omission of the AEC or its employees that clearly contravened a specific duty or exceeded statutory regulatory authority. We'll talk about that more in the next case, the Berkowitz case. So they didn't find that there were any breaches of duty 
by the test information officer, the RAD safe officers. They gave the information that the AEC required to be given. Now this raises the question that the AEC is both deciding what information is adequate and proposing the test, there is certainly a conflict in the agency. As the court put it, the, the plaintiff's entire case rests on the fact that the government could have made better plans. The court recognizes that that's probably correct, but that's not a basis for Federal Tort Claims Act liability. The Federal Tort Claims Act is not a vehicle for challenging government policy. Now, had a private party been doing the testing under these same provisions, not only would they have been liable, but you would expect that there might have even been attempts at criminal prosecution for knowingly endangering the public with extremely dangerous radioactive fallout. The Allen Court speaks directly to the question of whether there's a duty to protect the public. It held that it is irrelevant to the discretion issue whether the AEC or its employees were negligent in failing to adequately protect the public. This is a key question that's come up in later litigation, including the Katrina Levy breach litigation, where the trial court was particularly disturbed that the government ignored its duty to protect the public. It's very clear under the discretionary function exception that there's no duty to protect the public. As the court says, even if there were such a duty, the government could ignore it because the exception applies whether or not the discretion involved be abused. Court goes back to the original purpose of sovereign immunity, which is to insulate the United States from legal responsibility for injuries that be compensable if caused by a private party. Uh, the Congress can waive that sovereign immunity, which it did for limited purposes under the Federal Tort Claims Act, but unless the action that's being claimed as damages falls under the Tort Claims Act, there is no compensation. The court reminds us that there are other avenues for compensation. There's a specific statute uh, that provided funds for damages suffered by the public from nuclear incidents. And eventually there was federal money brought uh, in the uh, areas where the above ground nuclear testing was done that helped the plaintiffs in the in the Allen case after Hurricane Katrina, although all the litigation of the gov against the government was unsuccessful, the federal government through congressional appropriation gave New Orleans more than $80 billion for reconstruction. The final case we're going to look at in this section is Berkowitz by Berkowitz versus U.S. This is, deals with the limits of discretion. The Dalhite case and particularly the Allen case set, uh, a, set out a very broad notion of discretion. The question is, are there any limits to it? The plaintiff in Berkowitz claimed that he had contracted polio because an improperly prepared batch of oral live virus polio vaccine. If live virus polio vaccine is not sufficiently weakened so that it only it causes only a very mild infection, it can lead to a case of frank polio. It can also lead to polio even if the vaccine is properly prepared if the plaintiff is immunocompromised. Finally, there was still live polio in the community, so there was not clear evidence that plaintiff even contracted the polio from this batch of vaccine or that the vaccine was defective. The problem for the FDA is that their regulations required every batch of vaccine to be checked. But the plaintiff was able to establish is that the FDA only spot checked batches and had not tested the one his vaccine came from. So we have what looks like a clear failure to carry out a, a regulatory duty. 
The FDA argued that its discretion included the discretion to do spot checks even if its own regulations required it to test every batch. It relied on the decision in Varig Airlines which allowed the FAA to spot check airframes. Claimants in Varig Airlines alleged that negligent FAA oversight led to two lethal plane fires. Looking at the laws at issue, we find that Congress had given the Secretary of Transportation broad authority to establish and implement a program for enforcing compliance with airline safety standards. When the FAA implemented this statute, it reserved the right to do spot checking for air, uh, airplane problems rather than expecting, inspecting every airframe. So while the, the statute gave the FAA discretion and the FAA carried that discretion into its inspection policy by allowing spot checks, it also allowed employees to determine how frequently and how many airframes would be checked based on their evaluation of the risk posed by different manufacturers. So not only did the FAA retain the discretion to do spot checking, it retained the discretion to spot check different manufacturers' airframes on different schedules. Since these were pure discretionary decisions not mandated by the statute, they were found to not be subject to liability under the Federal Tort Claims Act. The problem that the FDA had is that when it adopted regs on inspecting batches of polio vaccine, it did not provide for spot checks. So the court found that while the FDA could have had regs allow, which allowed it to do spot checking, when it adopt, re, adopted regs that did not allow spot checking, it was bound by those regs until it would change them. As we'll, as we'll learn later on in rulemaking, this is a general principle that an agency limits its own discretion when it enacts regs. It can't ignore those regs and it can only change those regs by going through the same formal process that it used for adopting them. So the FAA could have reserved the right to do spot checking, but it didn't. Now, there are political questions in this. Had it been known that the FDA was not checking batches of polio vaccine, then there might have been public uh, unease about that and pressure on the FAA to do the checks. So we really don't know whether the FAA could have successfully established public standards that did not require it to check every batch of vaccine. After this case and some related vaccine liability cases, the Congress created another waiver of sovereign immunity by establishing the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Fund. This sets up a schedule of potential injuries caused by vaccines. These are mostly childhood vaccines, although some adult vaccines have been added. Uh, the process resembles the process for Federal Tort Act Claims Act claim, but the claims are presented to the Court of Federal Claims rather than to the FDA. Uh, part of this was, dri was driven by uh, vaccine liability cases that were arose from the swine flu vaccines in the 1970s. Uh, once this fund was established, uh, which pretty much limited claims, um, general claims against vaccine manufacturers. A group of attorneys started suing for autism, claiming that it was not due to the vaccine, but due to the preservative in the vaccine. And this was an attempt to avoid the liability caps of the injury fund, and also to avoid that the Court of Claims did not recognize that autism was a side effect of vaccination. So in the long term, the Court of Claims has steadfastly refused to recognize autism as a vaccine side effect, which is consistent with all of the science on the subject. But fears of vaccine have continued to undermine uh, 
the effectiveness of the mandatory immunization system and has led to the measles outbreak uh, earlier this year. Now there has been ongoing criticism of the Federal Tort Claims Act, again from both sides of the political spectrum. Uh, whether a conservative group or a liberal group, both are concerned about the government's ability to injure citizens without any redress in the courts. Uh, this is particularly severe in the cases where the discretionary function immunity uh, actually applies when the government knew that they were subjecting people to harm. Uh, these calls to broaden the liability under the act got louder after, Ma after Hurricane Katrina. There are a number of articles calling for creating liability for the federal government for failing to protect the public from flood measures. So far, the government has resisted these pressures and the Federal Tort Claims Act still controls damages, uh, claims against the government for flooding and other actions. So to test your knowledge, what are the basic principles of the discretionary function? Uh, exception, is the government liable if it knowingly injures the public? Why would we have such a standard? Uh, why aren't automobile accidents covered by the discretionary function exception? What are the limits of the discretionary function exception? And what are alternative remedies to the Federal Tort Claims Act when there is an accident or a mass disaster?